Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader. It's Damien, a.k.a. Um, I am back reporting for duty. I've been a bit intransient in that I only had seven comics this week. I finished them by Friday. I, every day I kept saying I'm going to do it this day, but then I got distracted. So um, not getting ahead of schedule after all, because today is Tuesday. Tomorrow the new comics will be coming out. And uh, maybe for some of you, it already is Wednesday by the time you see this or Thursday. But anyway, only seven comics. And uh, so I'll show you at the end a little bit of what else I've been reading this week. Seven felt a little bit too little. I often feel like, oh, no, I get too many comics during the week and I over flood myself with comics. And then this week I kind of missed the comics a little bit. So one thing that I should note is I've been on, I've been guests on a number of things. I was a guest. It was now kind of kind of a while ago, so I'm sorry I'm only mentioning it now, but I'll put a link down below to the long live stream I was on um, with Travis, aka Bueller with Comics. Um, I was on there with three awesome guys: Bueller and Sam from Tangles Web and Bob the ultimate bullseye Bob. So um, that was great fun, but it was a three hour stream. I don't know who can go back and watch something that long, but maybe you can catch it. part of it. We were trying to um, discuss 2019, but it was 2019 in the more organized, thought out way that uh, Bueller does his videos. So he, fo he had various categories of things we focused on many of which I felt guilty, I don't have a lot to contribute. Like, I don't read event comics and stuff like that. But even though I didn't read them, it was an interesting conversation. And I, I chimed in anyway. <clears throat> and then actually kind of, if you can't get enough of me and you want to know all kinds of non-comic book things about me, I was on this really fun podcast called Meanwhile at the Podcast, um, hosted by... Well, it has three hosts, but the only host that was there when I was on was George, and he's awesome, and I love talking with him. So if you want a whole bunch of irrelevant to comics talk, although there is talk about uh, buying modern art, not mo buying comic book art um, towards the end of the podcast. So I will definitely link that down below. And then Matt and I did one of our usual, but not usual, um, Never Stay Dead podcast, and that is on my feed here. But I'll also put the link to the to the um, Apple iTunes type of thing there for you. Um, and I think that was interesting because we talked about the whole decade of uh, our views on the decade of comics that was from 2010 to 2019. I originally had planned to do a um, sleepy vlog about it, but it turned out he was game to do it. And with him along for the ride, we probably talked a lot more about Marvel Comics than I would have on my own. So that, I think that was cool. So um, back to the stack of comics from last week. There's some comic, I can't remember which one, but there's some comic I've been meaning to get that I realized maybe wasn't on my poll. I think it might be um, uh, Grendel. Did that come out last week? Or maybe some other ones. Anyway, I've got the seven I've got. All of them were decent reads, so I feel bad, you know, putting one at the bottom and one at the top, but that's what I do here. As always, it's totally subjective. I'm not trying to be a um, real reviewer at all. I've, I've been there and done that. I've done reviewing for newspapers and such, and I have no desire on my YouTube channel to be that way. So this is totally at my whim of the moment, uh, how I felt about the comic as I read it. Possibly a, how I, a change in my feelings, possibly uh, as I sorted through the stack just now to put them in order. But I think it pretty much reflects how I felt as I was reading them. Disappointment, excitement, what have you. So there, as I said, there were no comic that like reached my, us, my highest level, but they were all solid middle level comics and some on the high side of that middle. On the lowest side of that middle at number seven, was Crone number three. I'm I'm actually liking this more than I was in earlier issues. The the plot is kicking into place a bit more. Um, it's still I would not call it a must read for Conan fans or fantasy fans. But if you need an extra fantasy comic to read, an extra Conan esque 
ish. I mean, the, the main hero is an elderly or supposedly elderly woman, an older woman. Um, but, and, and it also kind of has a setup with a kind of a dark lord, but it still has kind of the Conan, Sumerian age or hy Hyperborean age feel more than like Lord of the Rings and such. So, <clears throat> and it, it contained a pretty good twist, uh, which paid off from, from the previous issues. So that, that made me like it a lot more. I think, you know, part of always with these barbarian battle comics, a lot falls on the art. And, um, and to me, this artist is just okay when it comes to that kind of thing. So uh, speaking of art, in at number six for me was Olympia, number two, this image comic by Kurt Pyers and his dad, Tony Pyers, and artist Alex Diotto, Deconiff colorist Myers was the letterer. Um, so it was a fun read, and it's, it builds itself as an homage to Kirby and to uh, feel-good movies by... Um, who do they reference? It's, it's not here on this cover, but a Spielberg, Spielberg, Spielberg movies. That makes me a little dubious, but um, I think story-wise, it's kind of cool. I like the the meta, the light, fun meta quality of it. That there's this comic book at the store that's been canceled um, that shows us the story of our hero that he can't remember, uh, or our hero is the young boy, perhaps who's the fan of our hero, Olympia. And it's billed as a, um, and this is maybe to me its weakness, it's billed as an homage to Jack Kirby. And I find the art kind of semi-professional. I almost feel like I could draw a Kirby pastiche a little better than this. And, uh, and I feel like the artist is not, is just sort of almost making a, a lazy reference to Kirby rather than really digging into the Kirbiness, uh, and maybe I'm being totally unfair. Um, but just to remind ourselves, it's you know it re very much seems to reference Kirby Thor from the '60s. So let's take a look at some. I happen to have this omnibus near me. Let's just take a few look at a few pictures. Um, and the, one of the things is there's so much going on in every Kirby panel even if it's a simple action panel and and it's so in your face and blown out um there was a little bit of a fight scene i guess that i found in my quick flipping through before starting up that i thought sort of might serve as a comparison there we have some uh, other kind of kirby grandeur again i just flipped for a minute through this omnibus to look for something that might you know, be relevant. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. And then you look, this is probably very cruel of me, but really when you evoke a master, um, I think you, you owe it to yourself and your readers to put some effort into um, capturing that. That said, I will continue this comic. This issue actually I enjoyed even more than the first issue, uh, quite a bit more than the first issue. I felt uh, a lot of pleasure in the comic bookiness of it. Let's see. You know, to be really grand, they've got this kind of movie-like thing, but Kirby would have put so much, so much on these two pages. <laughs> I, the artist is probably not to blame for that picture. But um, there's kind of the weak reference to Orion of the New Gods, I suppose, visually. But anyway, it's still fun to read. Um, uh, I think for a comic book fan, but not not going into it thinking, oh, I'm so excited, I'm going to get some real Kirby stuff, real Kirby homage. Next up for me at number, let's see, seven, six, five, and number five was Justice League Dark. This was a very good comic, but I it still it continues to suffer for me the. Uh, the curse of the overlong story. It's just all starting to feel too familiar and somewhat repetitive, but still very exciting to read, great art. There's a rotating cast of artists, but this time it's um, Martinez Bueno. I didn't know Martinez was a first name, but uh, he does a great job of capturing this uh, 
sort of surreal horror horror style that seems to go so well with James Tinian's story. I was I'm kind of excited that James Tinian is switching over to write Batman, but on the other hand, when I think about this is now this is issue 18 and we're still basically getting the same story. I hope in Batman he goes for some shorter arcs and and uh, doesn't try to just explore one theme in 18 issues. Um, that said, I it's, it's still a comic book I really enjoy. I'm really enjoying just flipping through the pages of it right now. Um, so if you like the idea of superheroes and supernatural together, Justice League Dark is still a pretty hot comic book. So um, in at number four, is Ruby Falls. And if it had been like the other three issues, I think it would have been my, possibly my number one or my number two this week. But this issue felt, it was good, but somehow it didn't wow me as much as I'd hoped for an ending. Uh, there's a certain meandering nature to, um, to Anne Nocenti's writing these days. Maybe it was always that way. I don't, I don't really recall I recall what it was like. I need to go back and read Anne Nocenti's famous Daredevil run, I think. There were pages here where I love the color, other pages where it, it, it was less effective for me. Um, I'd been lo really loving the color here. So the story wraps up. It gently makes some more of its um, points about, about women's changing roles in culture and the struggle of all of that and, uh, and gives us kind of a happy ending. So nothing to complain about. I think it, when it comes out in trade, it'll be, for those who might be interested, it'll be a fun and interesting read, but not knock your pants off, not a must read. In at number three for me was Copra. And in some ways it doesn't deserve number three. It probably sh might be behind, on some levels, behind number uh, four and five. But there was something, there were enough pages that just kind of, felt unique and especially Copra-esque, like this splash page, that just made me really like this comic book more than, more than I should just based on the story, um, which feels like a kind of in-between story, setting up things for other issues, um, establishing and resolving things about relationships, some of which I understood, some of which I didn't because I haven't read every issue of Copra thus far. Um, there was kind of a, uh, a cool, oh, here's some cool panels. It was kind of a cool origin story for one of our characters who turns out to be from another dimension and her origin causes a third dimension to get destroyed along the way. And it's kind of fun how Capra just throws off these, um, these gigantic events kind of in the background um, of their more mundane story of uh, covert ops, which is an interesting reversal where the big cosmic stuff stays in the mostly in the background while it's all about just skulldodgery and the, and the like. Um, but there were interesting, interesting framings here that I really liked. There were these patterns down below. I don't know what they mean um, or if they mean anything, but I thought that was kind of cool. I kind of, I appreciate the fact, you know, even though he's not like the greatest illustrator in the world, that uh, Michael Fife is always experimenting with the visuals, with the layout, um, and that, that makes him of great interest to me, maybe because there aren't many artists who do that these days. Uh, and, uh, you know, he gives us some interesting pinups and stuff like that in here, too. So it's a fun, but, you know, not super consequential comic, I suppose, um, as from a story point of view. Then um, I'm really grow I Here I really am unsure between my number one and my number two. I could easily have flipped this everything at number two, everything number five, down to uh, num make it number one because I'm really liking this series more and more as it goes along. As I've said before, it's very David Lynch. Um, it has a lot of this deceptively simple art, very nice coloring, and it keeps developing the creepiness. What, one thing that surprised me is I thought it was a five issue limited series. 
and it's obviously continuing. Um, the story is is uh, not finished here. And um, I'm kind of glad of that, but there was another part of me that, that was looking forward to see how it would wrap up. Um, and maybe that's why I put it at number two. I still can't quite put my finger on whether where the story's going and whether uh, I can't anticipate whether by the end of the story I'll think it's great or think it kind of belly flopped and was a little meaningless. So we'll see. And then, so I'm putting Thor number one. <laughs> How many Thor number ones have there been in the last several years? But, um, or the last decade. How many Thor number ones have there been? A lot. Uh, so anyway, so it really isn't that big an event that there's a new Thor number one. The only big event about it is that it is now Donny Cates writing Thor. So it's a big enough event for them to uh, charge you an extra dollar and put some extra material in here and put out a ton of variant comics. I don't think the original comic cover, a uh, ton of variant covers, I don't think the original, variant, uh, original cover was even available at my shop by the time I got there. And I thought this was the best of the bunch. It's kind of a confusing yet cool picture with lots of um, old Thor scenes just collaged in. Almost like what might be on some insane Thor fan's wall who had cut out and collaged his favorite scenes from the history of Thor. And Donnie Cates sets up a good story um, with a... Uh, with, with Thor now the king of Asgard, which makes for a very different... The traditional Thor um, dynamic was his father was king of Asgard, and father was always getting mad at him and banishing him or punishing him or uh, wondering if he was good enough and him having to prove himself to his father. So now, where is he? I, I'm interested to see what Donny Cates has to do about that. There's little hints about about changes this is bringing on to Thor that may be symbolized by his hammer suddenly getting heavier. Um, so I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting. We get uh, a bit of a spoiler, sorry. Uh, Galactus falls on Asgard and apparently kills a lot of the gods there just by falling on them. And he only has one arm. And he's in terror of some horrible thing that's coming to destroy the universe. And that's where I maybe would have wanted to rank this lower, is there's so many comics about the universe getting destroyed. I am sick of it. I need a... What, can't a planet get destroyed? Can't one life be at stake? Why does it always have to be the whole universe? Feels like I just read two weeks ago or a week ago about old King Thor saving the universe. Um, and I've read how many other comics about people saving the whole darn universe. But um, the uh, artist, uh, what's his name? Is it, uh, pardon me, I've suddenly forgotten what his name is. Nick Klein, I think. Yes, Nick Klein uh, does a great job with this whole cosmic thing. Of course, very helped by his colorist. And now I'm paging again to try to find the credits, pardon me. His colorist, uh, Matthew Wilson. Oh, of course, no wonder the colors are so good. But, um, yeah, so my only caveat is that, yawn, having to save the universe again. Um, big epic. Now, it is kind of Donny Cates' wheelhouse uh, in uh, Silver Surfer Black. The Silver Surfer had to save and recreate the whole universe. Um, but one, one interesting thing to me, uh, and I'm not sure what my opinion of it is. Let's see if I can find it. If you look at the way Nick Klein, and maybe this is the way everyone is drawing Asgard now, it looks kind of like an Elizabethan small city. Um, I guess that would make sense if they still had Thor speak in thee and thou, which was Elizabethan language, not Viking language. Um, now they just give, give uh, the Asgardians a slightly different font to sort of imply they're speaking in an archaic way, I guess. But, uh, yeah, and there's another picture. Yeah, it's kind of this quaint 16th century hamlet, which um, is, since I had the Thor book out 
uh, is very at odds with the traditional Jack Kirby Asgard. There's a similar shot by Jack Kirby to what I just showed you, um, which is a, a sort of fantastical, phasma, phasm, I can't say it, phantasmagorical, but a, um, a sort of city out of crazy dreams, part futuristic, part sort of, I don't know, uh, medieval castles on steroids. So very different uh, approach. And um, I had another, oops, the paper on the page just slipped out. Oh, here's another, a better example of the crazy Jack Kirby Asgard. So at this point, I guess artists are not trying to recreate that at all. But I kind of like that feeling of Asgard being, you know, beyond the beyond as, yes, they're Norse gods, but they're also these fantastical, multidimensional, um, futuristic almost kind of people. So anyway, I had fun reading that Thor I, I, because of the, the main thrust of it, the cosmic quest stuff, I could take it or leave it. You know? So if for some reason my comic shop just couldn't get any more issues of Thor, I probably wouldn't be that upset. I, I'd feel like oh, I'm missing some good art. But I wouldn't be like, damn, now I'll never know if they saved the universe or not. I guess I would be a little sad if I felt like I was going to miss out on uh, what's going on with Thor as a king. And that, that part interests me more, but it seems to be it's going to get lost in the big cosmic battle. So speaking of big cosmic battles, what I'm reading since those comics is um, Marvel's House of X, Powers of X, hardback, which I got in the mail a little while ago. And what's driving me crazy about it is the art, particularly the colors. The colors just are making it really hard for me to read. But I'm going to plug away. I mean, I want to try to figure out what the heck Jonathan Hickman is doing here. I, I have to say I'm having a hard time. It was suggested to me maybe that the reading order isn't the best. They're just doing every other issue, I believe. Maybe it would be better to read House of X first and then Powers of X. I don't know. Um, but... I probably won't be doing a video on this because I will probably be doing a podcast with Matt. Uh, I'll probably do a episode of Never Stay Dead where we try to talk about Powers of X and House of X, the Jonathan Hickmania that happened here. I'm a little surprised with what I've read so far that people loved it so much because I'm so, I'm so struggling with my confusion on it and just feeling muddled by the colors. But I can, you know, at first glance, they look like exciting colors. They just don't help me read the comic. But maybe for other people, they work fine. So um, that's what I've been up to. And I will talk to you all later. If you can, check out some of the podcasts and videos that I've been on. Uh, if you have time to waste, you need to, you know, wash a giant boatload of dishes and you can listen to me jabber with other people. Talk to you later.